James Cameron is one of those rare filmmakers who's responsible for leaving multiple marks on the movie industry, and I don't think anyone's gonna deny the impact that Terminator 1 and 2 and Aliens had on the world. Let's rock! He's also had a hand in pioneering the usage of CGI in movies, and no better example of that is what he did with Titanic, and then later on when he wanted to drop off another billion dollars off at the bank and made the Avatar movies. And although I think Cameron hasn't made anything worth watching since True Lies, even I can't deny the impact that Avatar had on the world when it first got released. A movie set in the future when humans are off colonizing a planet called Pandora, mining a rare and expensive mineral with the human-controlled RDA organization, coming into direct conflict with the Na'vi, the indigenous tribes people who would probably just prefer to be left the hell alone. Relations with the indigenous are only getting worse. Yeah, that tends to happen when you use machine guns on them. It was the biggest movie of the year and ended up becoming the highest grossing movie of all time. It's also become one of a very long line of video games based off movies, and given their tradition of movie-based games often being pretty crappy, and in this case, a really low aggregate review score kinda backing that theory up, the biggest shock I had playing through this was not only is this not as bad as everyone makes it out to be, but I thought it was actually pretty good. What the hell did you think you were doing? Released in 2009 and even developed by Ubisoft Montreal with different versions between those on the PC, the Xbox 360 and the PS3, then the PSP and the Nintendo Wii but it's the Xbox 360 version I'm gonna be talking about today, and as I get older and wiser, I'm really starting to realize that simply popping a disc in a disc tray is a hell of a lot easier than spending like an hour dicking around on my PC to try to get an old game like this working. What's the whole thing about though? Well, let's find out. Let's find out! Now in the game you're playing as a signal specialist named Ryder, and before the whole thing kicks off you can choose your own appearance from a pretty lengthy list, after which you're then dropped off on Pandora in a starting area called the Lagoon, which is more or less the starting zone where you're still pretty high up on the food chain. Officer Midori's waiting for you near the main gate. Much like Sam Worthington's character in the movie, Ryder's someone who has the kind of genetic code that only one in a billion people possess, which means they can control one of the super expensive genetically engineered Na'vi as an avatar through a link unit pretty staggering to think about, much in the same way it's staggering to think that Sam Worthington was cast in two of the biggest movie franchises of all time, despite completely lacking charisma and talent. You don't have to tell me. Anyway, the first half hour or so of the game acclimatizes you with playing as a soldier, taking orders from the RDA. I'll do my best. But then it also switches things up a bit and lets you control your avatar in an attempt to kind of make you a bit more receptive to the plight of the Na'vi. I'm not here to make enemies. And this is important because very early on here, you're outright forced into picking a side. We're two avatars against these guys. We can take them. With this decision completely changing who you're playing as and what you're going to be doing for the next four or five hours. If you choose to side with the RDA, then your avatar body is destroyed and you'll be using assault rifles and grenade launchers, driving buggies and armored mech suits around whilst decimating the planet as you accomplish the goals of this mega mining corporation. I mean, honestly though, it's the Na'vi's fault, if anything, for being on this planet in the first place, right? If you side with the Na'vi though, it's almost kind of like a third person Far Cry game, where you'll spend more time in tune with nature, using the native animals as transport, and moving through these psychedelic forests like a giant gorilla warrior, fighting back with your trusty bow and collection of sharp pointy things. And actually too, I think the Far Cry comparison ain't the worst one to make here, considering the game was developed by Ubisoft and also uses the Junior engine, which was used in countless Ubisoft games as well, I mean Far Cry series included. And I think for a 2009 console game, it does look pretty damn good at times, with a lot of environmental detail, especially when you start looking closer at the lighting and the trees. Some of the best moments are when you're riding around the map in the middle of these giant conflicts, seeing both sides pitted against each other, and seeing the toll that the fightings really had on the planet, like this montage of destruction. For the environments you see in the Navi campaign, you just really see the damage the RDA has caused, as they've trawled across these massive areas of Pandora, and it really puts the scale of their assault into perspective and kind of justifies what you're fighting for. It really does feel like a living, breathing planet as well, and when you're running around on foot, you're gonna see all these various creatures either minding their own business or even attacking you. I mean, even the plants react to your presence, getting defensive or just hiding away, and even being brushed back by the physics engine when you walk through them. You can analyze and research all of this stuff too, which is pretty extensive, adding it to the Pandorapedia, which to me sounds like a sexual fetish that you should be arrested for. 
kind of reminds me a lot of Turok Evolution and the world you go through in that game, which is actually kind of funny to say, considering there's also moments in Avatar where you're flying Banshees, which is kind of similar to those flying sections in Turok as well. It's kind of weird to me too how a lot of reviews from back then seem to either gloss over the visuals or just ignore them entirely. And considering how faithful it looks to the film, it seems like it was a bit of an aspect that really should have garnered more attention. Enough. We speak no more of this. Characters from the movie like Dr. Augustine and Colonel Quaritch all show up for what's more or less cameos, but still, like, it's pretty cool seeing them here. You know, two years before the events in the movie and knowing what those poor clueless assholes have got in store for them. You can kiss my ass later, grunt. Even just the difference in the art style and locations between each campaign feels really varied, so you really do feel like each story and its backdrop is different and unique. And you know that Ubisoft could have totally just been lazy hacks and recycled these errors across both campaigns and just shuffled them around. I mean, it's not like Ubisoft to recycle a world map, is it? <laughs> The only downside to all of the presentation is that the game has a fucking horrendous frame rate at times, which kind of feels like it's dropping down near the lower two digit mark, along with some pretty awful pop in. I mean, at one point it was like half the map just forgot to load in, and then I saw the whole thing appear in front of my eyes like magic. Black magic. The fuck is that? But I think, regardless of which faction you go with, you're getting a good looking experience either way. And that is doubly impressive considering the Junior engine is about otherwise the most generic looking engine ever made. Out of all the video game engines that have ever existed, Dunia is definitely one of them. You'll see soon enough. Now, although each campaign differs in the story and the gameplay, they do share some pretty key similarities, mostly in how they're just both third-person shooters, and you're also tasked with exploring multiple opened-up areas of the planet, even able to speed up traversal with unlockable fast travel spots. Your goal is more or less to find something called the Well of Souls, and whether you're fighting for the humans or the Blue Man group, this requires finding three crystal shards, then harmonizing with magical willow trees, multiple times, along with of course removing any obstacle that gets in your way, whether it be the RDA or the Navi. <laughs> I've got to say too that whoever was in charge of how the save system works in this game should also get a goddamn medal. Because what they do here is leave a checkpoint right before you have to make that initial decision as to who you're going to side with. So this means you can skip over that prologue for your second playthrough, but then better than that, the save slots are split up for each faction. So you can hop back into either campaign at any point. Good. What I do think is worth mentioning though is that the campaigns are pretty different in how they play during that main gameplay loop. I do think it's going to change your perception on the entire game depending on which one you go with first. We're gonna die out here. Start. Okay, right, so I started with the RDA campaign and after you make your decision to side with these guys, you're then thrown into Pandora and given your first of many missions from various military and scientist NPCs. Chop chop, we're not paying you by the hour. A lot of which have the kind of voice acting that's just par for the course. Well, you've landed in a bloody hellhole, mate. The RDA just wants you to find the Well of Souls so they can manipulate it as they see fit, and by gum, you're gonna help them do that. You wear different types of body armor which give you added protection, mobility, and vitality, and for self-defense, you're using the more traditional fare, with weapons like assault rifles, shotguns, and machine guns. Out beyond the fence, every living thing that crawls, flies, or squats in the mud wants to kill you and eat your eyes for jujubees. And the general rule of thumb here is, if it moves, shoot it. If it doesn't move, well, shoot it anyway, because it probably deserves to die. Along with just shooting things until they're dead, you've also got a bunch of abilities, some more useful than others, which can be bound to the face buttons on the controller. Like being able to shield yourself to reduce incoming damage, and even turning invisible for a short period of time. Something which I think really should have been exclusive to the Navi. There's other ones like increasing the damage you do, increasing your movement speed, and one of the most important ones, being able to stun enemies for a few seconds, giving you some much needed breathing room. Along with calling down a goddamn airstrike on an area in front of you. Which is not only hilarious, but also just kind of awesome. I mean, look at it, it leaves behind this massive dust cloud. Not to mention the satisfaction that can only come from wiping out innocent creatures with needlessly destructive ballistics. Incoming. <laughs> All that's missing is a heavy metal guitar riff upon impact to really push it home. It. What's kind of interesting too is that the Navi can also use the same abilities against the player. Well, you know, their version of it anyway. This means you'll see these guys cloaked, you'll see them popping shields, and you'll get your bitch ass knocked out when they stun you. 
it genuinely got me pissed off fighting them at times, and I started to eliminate these guys with extreme prejudice, which I think ironically is kind of the point of this entire storyline. That you're really just going in there wiping out an entire civilization for a paycheck, and yet somehow the Na'vi, the people defending themselves, are the bad guys. You don't see them fucking each other over for a goddamn percentage. They really make no illusions here that siding with the RDA is the bad decision, and this campaign is really just about raising hell and scorching the earth, or scorching Pandora. You're blasting your way across the planet with all manner of deadly weapons and in all manner of deadly machines, gunning down the Na'vi and the wildlife alike, and gaining XP for all of it. I mean, you even gain XP for shooting plants. I mean, yes, yeah, some of them are hostile, but even the ones that aren't hostile and don't have any other purpose than just being window dressing can still be shot and killed for experience points. So the game's outright encouraging you to destroy every little piece of Pandora you come across and then just rewarding you for it. I mean, that right there is hilarious. You start off with a pretty basic roster of weapons, armor, and abilities, but as you complete missions and level up, you start earning better versions to all of this stuff. And there's a few weapons too, with an assault rifle, precision rifle, shotgun, machine gun, nail gun, and a grenade launcher. But the starting assault rifle is effective for pretty much the entire campaign, and the reload time combined with the mag size meant I just never really felt the need to use anything else. Outside of the flamethrower and the grenade launcher being better at killing plants, and shotguns obviously better at point blank range, there's not really any kind of skill or strategy to the rest of these, apart from just, you know, aiming the general direction of what you're trying to kill and hold down the fire button. On the very slim chance you run out of ammo, you've got dual pistols to fall back on, but even if you do run out of ammo, there's refill stations like every five seconds, which replenish your entire supply. I love these things. The enemies mostly include the Navi and the other native, albeit hostile creatures on Pandora like Viper Wolves and Thanators, the latter of which being responsible for one of the worst boss fights I think I've ever experienced in my 37 years on this planet. Yeah man, if you've ever wondered how truly bad hitboxes could be, well, wonder no more, bitch, and just look at this. In fact, the hitboxes in this game are kind of awful across the board, and you'll get knocked on your ass and spend more time on the ground here than a Premier League football player does chasing after a free penalty. There's a dodge roll move which is kind of crappy as it doesn't even seem to live up to its namesake, and the lack of iframes means you're gonna take damage when you really shouldn't. The Viper Wolves are the biggest offender there, and they're just really annoying to deal with, being, you know, more or less just dogs. And look, it's a scientific fact that dog enemies in video games are some of the most annoying enemies of all time. I think maybe only being beaten out by exploding kamikaze-style enemies, which can also just fuck right off. The vehicles are varied and fun to drive, but they also often handle like complete shit, randomly colliding into invisible objects and just frequently breaking the laws of physics. Yes. But apart from some egregious hit detection, most of the time you really do feel like this human wrecking ball, going through this fragile jungle and completely destroying an entire ecosystem, all under the command of a bunch of higher-ups who really couldn't give two shits about the fallout. You're an errand boy, or girl, sent by grocery clerks to collect a bill, and that bill happens to be the location of the Well of Souls. Not to be confused with the Well of Souls from Raiders of the Lost Ark, the River of Souls from Turok 2, or Heart and Soul by Huey Lewis and the News, a song so catchy that most people probably don't even listen to the lyrics. But they should! It becomes even more obvious too that the guy giving you your orders is a few cans short of a six pack, and eventually this dickhead goes off the rails completely, turning rogue and trying to destroy the entire planet. I mean, damn, daddy chill. What the hell is even that? So you're not only wiping out the indigenous people, but you're being given your orders to do this from a psychopath. And yeah, I can't think of any other point in history where soldiers were given their orders by a fucking lunatic. Not a single time. That was sarcasm, by the way. I'll see you on the other side. Still though, I didn't really feel too bad playing through this campaign, and playing as what was essentially a blonde Vasquez from Aliens made the whole thing even more fun and over the top upgrading my arsenal slowly over time and feeling like I was perpetually living out that one scene in Predator where they all lay waste to an entire rainforest was just epic. It's the kind of game that could have only come out during the Xbox 360 and PS3 era and the fact that this got such a low score when the experience is comprised of stuff like this just baffling. All this was missing was the characters high-fiving each other and shotgunning beers at the end of a mission. And if they had have included that, it could have been this really enjoyable and satirical take on how blindsided this bureaucratic military force has become and embraced how ridiculous the whole premise is. Baby, yeah. Does seem like they're trying to tell you though that this ain't really the right way to play the game, even if it might be the most fun. 
What the hell did you think you were doing? And you even get a second chance to switch sides again right at the end of the campaign. A decision you obviously don't get if you've sided with the Na'vi. Head Na'vi, join us and stop RDA. So like the game at this point is outright saying, are you sure you want to side with these guys? I mean, the name of the mission is even called The Right Choice. But you know what? As the saying goes, in for a penny, in for a pound. By the end of this campaign, you're even hunting down people who used to work for the RDA, killing their avatar, and then just outright murdering them when they're vulnerable outside of their link unit. Along with killing a bunch of Na'vi elders, which is kind of like walking into a retirement home with an assault rifle. Our residents are trying to nap! The story ends with Ryder gaining control of the Well of Souls for the RDA, causing complete disarray for the Na'vi and forcing them to retreat. So yeah, all in all, man, job well done. I mean, you rocked up on this gorgeous alien planet and within days had completely destroyed the local flora and fauna and sent the natives running to the hill, scattered, confused, and defeated. Yeah, brewskis all round, boys. I hope it was all worth it. Now, as for the Navi campaign, well, that's an entirely different kettle of three-eyed fish. And instead of assault rifles and shotguns, using bows, daggers, and clubs. Boy! The outlier here being a machine gun that never needs to be reloaded, and all I can think of there is that even back in 2009, video games were secretly trying to cater to game journalists. You also move a lot faster in this form, and the wildlife isn't hostile towards you either, unless of course you provoke them. But more than that, you don't get XP for killing them anymore, so there's no point to playing like that in the first place. Instead of hopping into drivable vehicles, you're hopping onto the back of dire horses or riding banshees through the sky, which is pretty awesome. Though there is a serious lack of the latter, which is definitely to the game's detriment. I'd say that if the RDA campaign is Wheeler from Captain Planet, well then the Navi campaign is Marti. You know, if Marti was 10 foot tall and walked around with a bow the entire time. And at first, I really didn't like this campaign that much, especially after the nailing blue balls to the wall experience I had with the RDA. But I think once I approached it differently and started playing a bit slower and tactically, it really started to click for me. Despite more or less outnumbering the RDA 100 to 1, the RDA easily outguns the Navi. So running around the middle of the open with, you know, a club held high above your head is going to get your ass handed to you faster than shit goes through a baby goose. You've still more or less got the same abilities as the RDA, it's just they've been reworked and changed around a bit to suit your appearance. So you can still shield yourself, you can still buff up your damage, go invisible, and increase your movement speed. The stun effect is more or less the same too, but now it locks enemies in place instead of causing them to run away, which is really helpful at priming them up for a good old fashioned bash in the skull. As for the airstrike, it's now like a swarm of birds, which, yeah, is as lame as it sounds. And you can also spawn in creatures from Pandora to help you, but that isn't as cool as it sounds either. You'll still unlock better versions of all of this stuff, along with bigger and better weapons and armor. And that's a good thing, because the damage you take in this campaign is insane. And you're gonna need all the help you can get. I mean, damn, dog, you die so quickly initially when you're playing as the Na'vi, it's actually kind of staggering. I think what they were trying to go for here is to really make you feel like you're going from this blue babe in the woods to a badass Pandoran predator, decimating these brain dead invaders with all of your homemade weaponry, and yeah, it definitely does achieve that. But fuck me sideways, I mean, you were an absolute piece of Swiss cheese early on in this campaign. You start off wearing basically scrap material for armor, the kind of outfit where you can see what your characters had for breakfast, like it's hand-me-down bandages that someone's used to wrap up a sprained ankle. But by the end of the story, you're decked out in much more protective attire, you've probably gotten the hang of how everything works, and found the skills and abilities that work the best, at which point you're gonna start tearing ass. Doing things like swapping to my giant two-handed club, popping a damage buff, and then wrecking those vehicles or mech suits in a matter of hits. It's pretty damn satisfying. <laughs> Still though, those first couple of hours are relentless, and you really do feel like a brightly coloured bullet magnet that goes down faster than a stripper's panties do at a Bucks Night Cruise. And again, like the RDA campaign, you still get knocked over all the time. And look, I get that that made sense as a human, but when you're playing as a Na'vi, this lean, elegant creature primed for combat through millions of years of evolution, to still get knocked over here like a bowling pin is just really annoying. The other issue that I had there too was that I often struggled to simply find who was attacking me. Now, that issue is kind of twofold. Firstly, I mean, the RDA are humans, and considering the Na'vi are supposed to be, what, like 10 feet tall, that adjusts the scale of these guys in the game, which means that when you're fighting them, it kind of feels like you're shooting at small children. 
And then what's not helping either is that they're wearing camouflage outfits and also using automatic weapons, which means most of the time you'll get absolutely shredded before you've even seen them. That's if you see them to begin with. Medic, medic. In comparison, spotting the Na'vi in the forest when you're playing as the RDA, it's like spotting skid marks on tidy whities and these aren't like elite soldiers or anything either, they're just your typical run-of-the-mill jarheads and grunts. No offense. None taken. Melee combat has much more of a focus here too, and the weapons in that regard are basic but effective. With daggers, clubs, bows, and staves. Is it staffs or staves? There's even a system where you can let out a flurry of blows if you rack up a combo of five. Being able to cloak, shield, or rush forward at super speed lets you close the distance on enemies quickly so you can fully engage with these melee weapons, but then the cooldown on these skills is kinda long, so it's not really as useful as it really could have been. And this is actually what I think lets the combat down the most here, because it would have been way more fun, I think, if you could have abused these abilities to really focus on the melee combat and make these soldiers dread turning up for work that day. But instead, you can't, because after you pop a shield or buff up your damage or cloak, that's it. You kind of bust over the next couple of minutes and just rely on the more basic means of separating someone's soul from their body. Overall, it's just a much more punishing combat system than the RDA campaign, and it means you're going to have to often let aggression take a bit of a back seat, which is fine because the Navi bow, which is always equipped by default, is one of the best weapons in the entire game. Able to kill most standard soldiers in a couple of hits, if not a single hit. With this thing, you more or less just hold down the fire button to draw an arrow, and then it often snaps to a nearby enemy, and this makes lining up multiple shots as easy as taking a piss. The few times the environment allows you to switch between ranged and melee options, you know, if there's something to break line of sight, and take out enemies routinely is when the combat truly shines but it just never consistently manages to ride that high. And that's a damn shame, man, because that's holding it back from what could have really been a satisfying combat loop. What are we supposed to do now? Still though, I can't think of too many open world games where I chose to traverse to the next location on foot instead of using vehicles or fast travel. And this is one of those rare instances when that was the case. Simply, I think because it just made me feel like a big man dunking on these random RDA patrols. It makes me feel like a big man. So when it works, man, I mean, god damn, son, it really works. And I think overall, problems aside, I still enjoyed this campaign. And running around as a 10-foot tall blue warrior waifu with armor that had holes and gaps in all the right places was about the most fun I've ever had over a five-hour period. Aside from that time, I dropped acid and watched a bunch of foul compilations on YouTube. Me? You gotta be kidding. But again, I can see how one campaign might be better or worse for each person depending on the order you play them in, but because they do play differently and each have their own strengths and weaknesses. <laughs> The major problem the Na'vi campaign has is that it doesn't have a dedicated melee button. Now, any other game like this that's got a combination of range and melee might bind your ranged weapons to the left and the right shoulder buttons, and then maybe X or the A button to melee. And I mean, this isn't like an entirely new or alien concept. Games as far back as Devil May Cry and the PlayStation 2 did the exact same kind of thing. And it allows for an easy switch up depending on what your current situation is. However, for this, you've got to manually swap back to a melee weapon or vice versa to a ranged one, completely removing that seamless flow that you could have gotten between the two. I think the Navi campaign also feels a lot shorter than the RDA one. This campaign, again like the RDA one, has both factions converging on the Well of Souls in one last struggle, and for both factions, all you need to do is stand your ground against this final push. After that, you take your transport mode of choice to the Well of Souls, and in the case of the RDA, you've got one final boss fight against your rogue commanding officer, Falco, voiced by none other than Paul Eading, aka Roy motherfucking Campbell. Loud and clear. What's the situation, Snake? A fight, though, which is pretty much over before it begins. As for the Na'vi campaign, though, there's no final boss at all, and it just ends with a bit of dialogue before throwing you to the end credits. This is only the beginning, Tanjala. More humans are coming. Right. As for the RDA campaign, well, I think the problem that one has is that it's just kind of repetitive. For pretty much every area you visit, the overarching objective is just to find the same looking three crystal shards before the Navi do, then harmonizing them at the closest willow tree. Yeah, every single time. Plus, it also is like a pretty rudimentary third-person shooter, lacking basic features like cover mechanics, aiming properly down the sights, and a dodger evasion system that isn't complete dog shit. It's not terrible, but it does feel more like a shooter that you'd play back in 2006 or 2007, not 2009. Come on! 
But the objectively weakest component of Avatar, I think, is the Conquest minigame. Now, here's a mode you can only access with the fast travel system for some reason. And it's a turn-based strategy mode where you buy combat units from credits earned in the campaign and then try to take over these small pockets of the planet one at a time. So yeah, so the XP you earn in the main part of the game is converted into credits. You then spend on buying three kinds of troops. But even over the course of an entire playthrough for both the RDA and the Navi, I didn't even come close to having enough cash to take over even a quarter of the planet. The answer to that is the Echo Chasm, an unlockable area you can play through where enemies just keep spawning in, and you can repeat this thing endlessly for XP and credits. In other words, grinding. And what's the benefit to all of this, you might be asking? Well, the benefit is that you can earn bonus XP and also upgrades to things like player damage and accuracy when taking over these key zones. But the only problem is that those upgrades and those bonuses are just kind of pointless. I mean, for starters, you're going to simply earn XP faster by just playing the game normally. And those bonuses, well, they aren't even really that beneficial either. I mean, like a 5% bonus to weapon damage or weapon accuracy, it ain't going to exactly turn the tide of the war, you know what I'm saying? Especially after you finish the main game. It just kind of feels like a half ass mechanic, and the fact you literally need to grind credits if you have any chance of completing this mode, you know, meant I bothered with the whole thing even less. Finally, I guess it's worth mentioning just how piss poor this game was received by critics all those years ago. And the whole thing of this game getting such low review scores is something that I find really odd, especially considering how some sites like Eurogamer gave it a 5 out of 10. Now look, anyone who watches my videos knows I never put a number on a video game, but if I had to put one on this game, look, it'd be a 7, compared to your mum, who's a hard 4. You can't keep getting away with it! Yeah, a 7. I mean, this is the most 7 out of 10 video game that I've ever played, which is fine, but the problem is that some gamers have become so entitled that something scoring even essentially 70% is somehow seen as a bad thing. Avatar is far from a perfect game, but for such a faithful movie tie-in to have a decent length like this, not to mention such simple and addictive gameplay to then score so low is, like I said before, just kind of baffling. No, it's not. And I really think what's happened there is the 2009 curse, if I can call it that. And what I mean when I say that is that this was really one of those periods in gaming where we truly had some of the best releases of all time, especially for the seventh generation of consoles. I mean, let's break it down, man. We had games like Batman Arkham Asylum, Uncharted 2, Assassin's Creed 2, Resident Evil 5, Bayonetta, and Infamous. And even the year before that, we had GTA 4, Metal Gear Solid 4, Motherfucking Dead Space, Fable 2, and Saints Row 2. There's no two ways about it. We were just selfish, spoiled bastards fed with a silver spoon. And unknowingly, I think, getting some of the best games we were ever going to play. A lot of which went on to have incredibly successful and lingering franchises. And I just remember that, like, it always seemed if a game back then didn't get, like, an 8 or a 9 out of 10, it would always seem to be lower, like, around a 5 or a 6. And I think the Avatar game is one of those unfortunate victims, which is sad because it's really not as bad as it looks. I know that an arbitrary number given to a video game, mostly by the kind of people who don't even finish these games to begin with, shouldn't matter, but it kind of does when it's up there as like this eternal monument. And it's part of the reason too why I put off playing this thing for so long. I'll be pretty keen to see the way Ubisoft take things when they make the new Avatar game in the coming years, but for now, I do think this is one of those rare hidden gems that somehow fell through the cracks. And if you are a fan of the movies, at least it'll give you something to play through, you know, until Cameron releases part 3 a decade or so later.